Back in uh, October 2011, I was, I was stepping foot for the last time on a bodybuilding stage. And I remember it was the Mediterranean Championships. And I, uh, I clearly remember when I was at backstage. So I was backstage with other 50 athletes from different countries in the Mediterranean, Italy, Spain, Egypt. Um, and there was this guy in particular from Israel. Now, what we do usually in backstage is apply tan, pumping up, eating rice cakes with some jam or peanut butter, the usual stuff bodybuilders do before they go on a bodybuilding stage. But this guy from Israel was different. He was wearing this baggy tracksuit, sitting down, reading, reading a book. And my first impression was, what is, what is this guy doing? He must be so good that he's, he doesn't need to do all this stuff. So then they called us to go on stage. Everybody's going up, pumped up, and this guy takes off his clothes. So he's white as snow. He's wearing a red posing trunks, so he's representing Israel. But he looks like the flag of Malta, white and red. And no muscle at all. So it was visible for everyone. Everyone could tell that this guy was not a bodybuilder. So he was with us. He was among us. But he wasn't one of us. And that's the main thought for today's message. We read that they were with us, but they were not from us. They didn't belong to us. And the, mess the title for today's message is Wheat or Weeds, referring to the parable of the weeds. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and we'll read the parable. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your feed? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus then goes and explains this parable. And uh, he says that the field is like the world. And we know that in this world, Christians grow alongside with non-Christians, with non-believers. We agree that, we know that, and we accept that. That we're living in a world where there are unbelievers also, but then one, what when it comes to the church? I would ask this question. Is it possible to have wheat and weeds <laughs> growing together in the church? And we will answer that, this along, along the way. 
Now, in, in the previous chapters, we saw John giving some contrasts. We saw the light in contrast with darkness in chapter 1. And in the first verses of chapter 2, John gives a contrast of God the Father in contrast with the world. But now in these verses, we're going to see another contrast. We're going to see Christians in contrast with Antichrists. By now we know that in this epistle, John challenges his readers. He challenges his readers by um, giving, naming a number of tests. And these tests are there so we can evaluate or examine our faith and ask those crucial questions. Am I really saved? Am I really born again? Am I truly in fellowship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus? Do I love Jesus? Do I really love Jesus? Not just have an affection for Jesus or like the things that Jesus gives us, but really loving Jesus. These are the questions we should ask, our, ask ourselves. Now, coming back to today's, to today's portion of scripture, first we need to understand the context we are living in. In context, we are living in similar times to when John was writing this letter. Back then, they had no TV, they had no social media, but false converts, false prophets, and false teachers were all over the place. Today, we have people claiming to know Jesus. They have some association with Jesus, but the Jesus they profess is not the Jesus of the Bible. We need to understand truth from lies. We need to understand, we need to discern the differences between Christians and antichrists. Now, what does antichrists mean? Anti meaning, not, not anti, not siya in Maltese. Anti means against or instead of. So antichrists or the spirit of antichrist, which in reality has been with us since the fall, since Genesis chapter 3. So antichrists are those who are against Christ or want to take the place of Christ. So in, um, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, we read the reason, the purpose behind these words. John writes, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. What are these things that John is writing about? Now, um, the setting of these verses is a warning. If you remember back in, uh, in, in verses 15 and 17 of chapter 2, John gave another warning, and the warning was, do not love the world. The things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So the warning was, the world outside the church. That was the warning. But the warning now is the dangers that one can face in church. Let's start in verse 18. John opens with a truth. Let's go. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So John, John starts off with this truth. And it's, it's like as if he's saying children. Now, those of you who have children know what I'm going to talk about. Imagine I'm, uh, I have two kids and I, I want to cross the road. I know it's dangerous. And kids, they're careless. They're not aware of the dangers. So you tell them, hey, hey, boys, hold my hands. Because from where we are 
to where we need to go, there's going to be dangers. So lift your head up. Look around you and be, be alert. And it's, you, can, you can feel, as John is saying this, these things to his readers, listen to me, hold my hands. I'm going to tell you some stuff because it's, it's, it's pretty rough. It's dangerous. Now, John assumes that his readers know already about the actual person, the Antichrist, because he doesn't say much about him. Actually, the, the teaching about Antichrist has been, has been around since Daniel chapter 9 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul talks about the men of lawlessness and the Antichrist, has been circulating around ter at least 30 years. Then when, when John was writing this, this letter, so he assumes that the readers, they know these, uh, the, the stuff. But his concern is not the actual man of lawlessness, the beast, the antichrist, but the people that will come before him, antichrists. Let's read verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now I can spend hours talking about who these antichrists are. I can mention the Catholic Church, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons. I can point fingers towards others. But I'm not, I'm not going to do that this morning. Before we can discern these antichrists, let's ask a question to ourselves. It, it might be, it might sound hard or difficult to, to swallow, but let's ask the question, am I truly a Christian or am I an antichrist? Wow, that sounds, that, that, that sounds hard. Huh? There are many signs, there are many differences between Christians and Antichrists. I don't have the time to go through all of them, but from these verses, we can draw out three points. First point, first sign of Antichrist is that they depart from the church. They depart from the fellowship. Now, Jesus makes it clear that only those who produce fruit are truly born again Christians. So you can spend your whole life in church. That doesn't mean you are saved. But staying in church, staying in fellowship with the saints can be an evidence of you being a Christian. Because if you are an antichrist, you won't stay in the church according to John. Now, and the Bible makes it clear that it is very dangerous to depart from the fellowship. So the main differences between Christians and Antichrist that we can draw from these verses is that a true Christian stays in fellowship. Antichrists depart from the fellowship. A genuine Christian preserves, perseveres in the faith. Storms come, challenges come in life, everybody has, uh, has his issues, but a genuine Christian, a true Christian, perseveres in faith. Antichrists deny the faith. They deny the master. We will, we will uh, study this more on Tuesdays. On, on a side note, I, I really encourage you to come on Tuesdays because in 15 minutes, not much can be said. But in an hour on Tuesday, we can explain this more in detail. True Christians build each other up. Antichrists deceive the faithful. And that's the warning this morning. God entrusts born-again believers with a message. What is this message? A message of reconciliation. So a true Christian has this message. But antichrists 
are divisive. They always stir up controversy. You always find these people in the, middle, in the midst of conflict. And some may say, ah, because they're mature Christians. If they are mature Christians, they would take correction and they would stop doing what they're doing. But antichrists do it to divide, to divide the people of God. A true Christian serves and considers others better than himself. Antichrists want to be served. And they want to be served because they think they are better than anyone else. So again, let's ask the question, am I wheat or am I weeds? Am I truly a Christian or am I an antichrist? The list goes on, the list goes on. But everything comes down to one truth. And what is this truth? Christians have Christ. Antichrists, they don't. Christians dwell, they abide, they have fellowship with Christ. Antichrists, they don't. They might say they have fellowship with Christ. They can say they have an association, an affection for Christ, but they don't abide in Jesus. Do I abide in, Christ, in Jesus? Do you abide in Jesus? Let's ask these questions constantly to examine ourselves. The time, time has gone already. I wish I could. We'll, as, as, as I already said, we'll, we'll, we'll study this subject more on Tuesday and next, next Sunday. But before we leave this place, before we leave this place, I want, I want to challenge you again and ask you a question. Let me ask the question to myself first. Now I'm here, I'm talking to you, I'm preaching, but I, I really must ask, ask myself, have I really surrendered my heart to Jesus? Have I surrendered my life to Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? And if the answer is yes, then I encourage you this morning and I pray that yes, storms will come, but stay strong. Be faithful. God has given us an amazing reward. In Christ, we have eternal life. So keep running the race of faith. Take courage. Be the light and salt of this world as we heard this morning already. Let's be like Stephen. Let's be bold. Let's be courageous. But if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, if you examine yourself and you think that you're not wheat but weeds you still have time you are here this morning breathing you have life so now is the time to tell God to ask God to forgive you to surrender your life to Jesus and ask him, tell him, Jesus, you are my God. Jesus, you are my king. You are my master. You are my Lord. Forgive me. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us this morning. Lord, I pray that as we go out of this place, we go out as a different person. Yes, Lord, if I know that I'm saved, Help me by your Holy Spirit to stay in this narrow path. And help me to truly be the light, truly be the salt of this earth. Yes, Lord, if, if I think that I'm not saved, help me. Help us. Save us, Lord. So when that day comes and we will see you face to face we will not shrink away in shame before you 
but we will look forward with eagerness to see you and to receive our awards. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you. And yes, Lord, we sing. We sing together as a congregation. Let's stand up. We sing together, Lord. You are our God. You are Creator God. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for you are the King of Kings. You are our King. You are our Master. You are our Lord. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will desire more of you, Lord, and less of us and less of this world, but more of you, that we will hunger more of you, we will hunger more of your word, word, Lord. Lord, I pray that we will stop playing Christian, stop playing church, and truly be Christians, truly be the church. We truly are your disciples, Lord. So you get all the glory, you get all the praise in Jesus' mighty name.